Good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Osborne. I'm one of the pastors here. I oversee the adult ministries, and it's my privilege to take a little break from the book of Mark study that we've been doing and open up the Old Testament with you today. We'll be looking specifically in the book of Genesis for, uh, chapter 39 in our time today. So if you want to go ahead and open up your passage of your Bible to that passage, page, chapter 39 of Genesis, we'll be in the whole chapter today. Looking at a very familiar story, perhaps from a different angle. So Genesis chapter 39, beginning in verse 1. I'm going to read it and then we'll engage the text. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and attended him, and he made him overseer of his house, and he put him in charge of all that he had. And from time to time, And from that time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in his house and in the field. And so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and he fled and he got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. And then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home. And she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard these words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. And whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Let's pray as we begin our time. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time when we can gather with your word open before us. Lord, may you direct our affections towards you and away from the lesser things that demand our attention. So, Lord, as we gather now, we trust in the power of your word to do your work in our hearts. Lord, may we be attentive to the areas of our life that your spirit will press upon. May we have faith to trust you and live in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you grew up in one of the mainline denominations of any sort of church in America, or perhaps you grew up Catholic, you will be familiar with what I'm about to say to you. This phrase that I'm about to say will cause you to respond in a certain manner. And the phrase is, may the Lord be with you. And you instinctively will reply, well done. I was a little nervous that no one would reply. 
At first look, that's a very simple phrase, isn't it? Uh, And we say it so often that perhaps we lose the depth of what is being said or intended to say as we speak those words to one another. And we may even think it simply as just a a well-wishing. I hope you have a good day. You too. But the weight of that phrase is something that we need to fix on today. The sermon title is actually, The Lord Be With You, and you'll see here shortly why we titled it as such, because these simple words carry with them the only hope we have in the midst of profound despair. Only in the presence of God is there any hope in the midst of profound despair. And as we look at our text today in Genesis chapter 39, we can catch kind of a flavor of profound despair in the life and the practice of our main character in this text, Joseph. And as we think about Genesis chapter 39, the main idea that we are to read chapter 39 with is the Lord was with Joseph. It's at the beginning of your text. If you look, it's at verses 2 and 3 and 4. We see that the Lord was with Joseph. And it's at the end of your text, as Joseph finds himself in prison, that the Lord was with Joseph. It bookends the story. So therefore, the author of Genesis, who was Moses, is writing this with the idea that we read the story through the lenses of the Lord's presence being with Joseph. It's a pretty important thing that we do to read this story with that intent in place. Because sometimes we read this story and think that it simply is a moral lesson on how to succeed in the midst of turmoil or how to fight against temptation. And it is those two things, but it's much, much more. This story is much, much more than simply those two things. You see, this narrative takes the reader into a place where we recognize that no matter what occurs in our life, No matter what it is, the very best thing or the very worst thing, the presence of the Lord in those moments is our anchor and our sail in our life. We are held by his faithful presence and we are moving in his sovereign providence. And so today I want to pull out quickly with you just three areas that we can see the impact of the Lord's presence with Joseph in this particular story. And so the three areas are we look at the success of Joseph, we look at the temptation of Joseph, and then we look at the isolation of Joseph. So let's start about the success. Verses 1 through 6 is where we're going to start. Joseph is successful. The Bible tells us that. He became a successful man. By all measures, Joseph has climbed, into the, climbed the ranks in Potiphar's house. He is the mark of one who has reached the pinnacle in this place. He really is the ultimate rags to riches story. We love those types of stories. He was sold into slavery by his brothers, chapter 37 of Genesis, if you want to read that. He was bought by the chief of the Egyptian army, Potiphar. He was placed into service in the man's household. And over time and through his faithful and good work, this young man has shown himself to be not just a good worker, but an exceptional one. Exceptional in his work ethic, exceptional in his organizational ability. In fact, you'll notice if you read it carefully in verses 2 and 4, we see a progression of his advancement. We see in verse 2 that he was working in the house of the master. Not a normal position for a young man. A slave who was bought was typically as a young man was put into the fields to work. But to be brought into the house of the master reveals something unique about this man. And he was taken into that house. And once he's in the house, verse 4, he's the attendant of the man of the house, of Potiphar. He's the caregiver to Potiphar, ensuring that all of Potiphar's needs are managed and met before he even knows that he has them. And then ultimately, we see in verse 4 that Potiphar notices this and puts him in charge not only of himself, but over the entire house. He is the COO of a major, major household in Egypt, a household that is, only has its power surpassed by the power of Pharaoh's household himself. He went from a bought boy in a household to the one who controls the household. 
And I think we could pause and say, this is a remarkable thing. And our tendency would be, and we've heard sermons about this, to look at the capabilities of Joseph and say, wow, if we simply put these things into our own existence, then we too can be successful. That's not why that is there. This passage talking about the success of Joseph is clarified by Moses on why he includes that in this passage. Because if we look here, we see that the success was directly attached to the Lord's blessing upon him. God gave Joseph success. God gave him success in all that he did. And it was success given to Joseph so that then Joseph might actually be a direct fulfillment of the promise that God gave to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. For in Genesis chapter 12, as God called Abram to follow him, he gave him a a promise and said to him, I will bless you and through you, you will be a blessing to all nations. And so while not, not a complete fulfillment of that covenant between God and Abraham, this is a direct fulfillment. For we see in Joseph, Potiphar's household blessed through Joseph's work as God blessed him. And we see this is really the reality for Potiphar's house, but also at the end of the narrative, we see this is the reality when Joseph was in prison. In the midst of success and in the midst of despair, God gave success for the intent that people would recognize the presence of God. Now, this is an easy transfer, right? I wonder, if you look at your life and you see your accomplishments, whatever they might be, it could be financial, it could be familial, you could have a great family, it could be a nice house, it could be wonderful friends, it could be that your future is bright, it could be any of those things. I wonder if you look at those things and you say, these things are God's gifts and God's doing in my life, or if you say, I am awesome. Because I think it is a dangerous thing to rely upon our awesomeness to determine whether or not we are successful. God was concerned about this with his people as well. This is not just simply something that we pull out of this text and say this is what it means. This is a concern that God has for humanity in general, but specifically for Israel, because he knows the human heart. Our intent, our desire is oftentimes to look at ourselves and remark it ourselves. And in Deuteronomy, God is giving instructions to his nation, his people, Israel, as they're about to enter into the promised land. And he's very concerned that they will enter the promised land, this land of promise, and say that they got themselves there. And he says, take care, be alert, be aware that as you enter the promised land, remember that God led you here. That as things get good in your life and you're no longer wandering in the desert, and you're eating the figs, and you're drinking the good wine, and you're living in your plus-sized house, and you're driving the latest Range Rover version of a chariot, that you will remember that it is God that brought you there. He says, take care, because the temptation of your heart in the midst of good times will be this. Look at Deuteronomy 8, 17, and it'll be on the screen. Our temptation is to say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he might confirm his covenant. So why does God warn them? Is it simply because he wants the credit? It's it's not that. The purpose is that the world might indeed see that God is the God of a covenant, that he is faithful to his people. See, success in God's economy is never simply for success's sake. It's very hard to say. It's a lot of S's. But it is never simply for success' sake that God gives you success. It is always meant to be turned into a blessing of some magnitude. Why? Because it is God's. And Christians, when God gives you success, we should be gracious and and humble in receiving it. We should be grateful and understanding that this is directly from God and that allows us then to be generous as we give away the things that God has given to us. And we should also be gracious when other people are successful, thankful that God has been faithful in their lives in this regard. And so at the beginning of our text, we see that the Lord was with Joseph in his success and by the way, he is with you and yours. But there's more to this story. 
The second point I want to emphasize is that the Lord was with Joseph in his success, but he was also with him in his temptation. See, the Lord's presence in Joseph's life does not mean that he will be free from temptation, nor does the Lord's presence in your life mean that you will be free from temptation. In fact, if we were to like pull back the covers a bit to this story, we recognize that actually the success and the blessing on Joseph were the opportunity for temptation to enter in. For we look at the text and we see that he was hardworking and faithful and he was responsible to such an extent that Potiphar actually left everything in his care. And he went away to take care of what he had to take care of and left Joseph at home alone with Potiphar's wife. And at the end of verse 6, we read that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. He's a good-looking young guy. Now, this point in the story, we think that Joseph had probably been in the household of Potiphar for roughly 11 to 12 years. So he probably was mid to late 20s at this point in time. He had been in the home long enough to establish his trajectory in that household. He was powerful. He was successful. He was attractive. And here is a woman who is looking for all those things while her husband is away. And I want you to notice the repeated nature of temptation because there's a few lessons that we can even look at this and say, ah, temptation has a trait about it. And if we look at verse 10, we see that day after day, this woman would approach Joseph with the temptation to lie with her. And see, this is a, something we need to think about here as Christians in this world. Temptation is rarely just a one-time experience. It repeats. But not only does it repeat, it oftentimes progresses. For we see that with Potiphar's wife and Joseph. We see that there was a progression in her, the way in which she presented herself to Joseph. We see that Joseph says in verse 10 that he would not listen to her, that he would not lie beside her, and that he would not be with her. Three different progressions here. These are reflective of her attempts to be with Joseph. You just think about this. Let's just add a little bit of color to this story. Joseph comes in from work one day and Potiphar's wife is there and she says, just come here, talk for a bit. Let's just talk. You need to talk, I need to talk. Or another day, she says to him, you know, I know you're tired. It's, it's been a hard day leading this household, and I just would like you to come here and just lay here with me. Just relax. It's difficult to lead this household. The progression of temptation occurs, and the desired end of is erosion of conviction. And we see this attempt on Joseph's conviction uh, as he goes through this story. And the thing about temptation, as we engage in, as Joseph engages it here, is it never just simply remains a temptation. There is a point in time when you must make a decision in the midst of that temptation. Will I follow the way of God or will I give in and commit a sin? And we see here, there is that point for Joseph in verse 11. On the one day, he comes into the house and no one is there. And Potiphar's wife sees an opportunity and she grabs his robe. At that point in time, will Joseph's convictions be enough or will he give in? Now, we know the story. He stripped out and he ran. He fled. There was no flirtation. There was no little bit of gleeful interaction. This was a decision by Joseph. And how was he able to do, do this? Well, we're given the answer by the statements that reveal his conviction. Look at the, your text here. And as we see his words to Potiphar's wife in verse 8 and verse 9, we realize where his convictions lay. In verse, verse 8, we see that Joseph's convictions in the presence of the Lord, the Lord being with him, resulted in him living a life of wisdom. So verse 8, he says, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. There's a reality that his first thing that occurred was that he was simply wise in his rebuff of her. There's a common sense reality to this act that could very well ruin Joseph's life. Proverbs, the book of wisdom in the middle of your Bible, gives us many, many words of wisdom and warnings about what we should or should not do in life and the consequences attached to both. And one of the areas that Proverbs talks about is the effect of adultery in a man's life. It is destructive. 
And in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32, we read, he who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor and his disgrace will not get wiped away. Proverbs is pretty clear about this. It gives basic wisdom and it gives basic advisement on how to live wisely. It would be foolish for Joseph to engage this. And as I was thinking about the wisdom of Joseph this week, I kept returning to Proverbs 9.10 where we understand what the basis of all wisdom is and that is the fear of the Lord. So the fear of the Lord, the realization of the Lord's presence in his life drove Joseph to a place of wisdom, but it also drove him to a place of worship. If you look in verse 10, or verse 9 rather, we read that Joseph frames this act as great wickedness and sin against God. This isn't a question by Joseph. He's not asking Potiphar's wife, how could I do this? He's making a statement that reveals his value system. He's clarifying how he makes his decisions. Now, see, it isn't willpower that is going to deliver Joseph from this temptation. And it isn't willpower that will deliver you and I from temptation. We just simply aren't powerful enough inside of ourselves. But what will deliver Joseph from temptation is a greater affection. An affection for something greater that will indeed minimize the temptation or place the temptation in front of him in a proper place. He has a greater affection for God than for the temptation that is in front of him. And this is the only way that Joseph is able to overcome this temptation is the fact that he has a greater love that puts all lesser ones into their proper perspective. And this statement reveals that his greater love is the purity of God and his holy presence. But even as we recognize this, Even as we read these words of Joseph, we recognize that our love for God is often battled by our own justification for our sins. And maybe I'm just speaking about myself here, but I am a really, really good attorney for myself. And I know that you guys are as well. And so as we look at Joseph's story here, there's a lot of ways that he could have justified this. And let me just give you a couple. I think Joseph probably could have justified this for himself because he felt sorry for himself. I mean, think about his life. If anyone had a reason to just let go and enjoy himself for a bit, it was Joseph. Slavery, betrayal, in a pit, bought, placed in a home far away. A pity party he could have had, and that's an open door for temptation to walk through. See, sin is often framed as self-care, isn't it? It's often framed as a way to take care of yourself in the midst of issues. Maybe another justification for Joseph is, I've been a slave. Maybe this is going to be the only opportunity I have to be with a woman. Sin also is framed as an opportunity. Maybe another way is Joseph looked at the household and said, look, Potiphar is a bad man. He's not here. He doesn't take care of his wife. He's more concerned about his career. I'm here. She obviously needs cared for. Perhaps I could do it. By the way, Hollywood would have loved this story, wouldn't they? They would have taken this story and made a slight twist to it, though. They would have said, ah, the forbidden love is better than the loveless marriage. They would have highlighted this. See, sin is often portrayed in our own hearts as the better way, isn't it? And lastly, maybe Joseph could have justified his sin. What happens if he doesn't do it? He's in charge of the whole household. And if he doesn't do this, this would come back on him and he would lose his place and all the people in the household who rely upon him would then be on their own. Sin oftentimes could be justified as care for others. There's a reality that sin is active and we are active in our sinful nature of creating gray areas. And there are indeed ethical gray areas and uh, decisions are hard to make sometimes. But let's just be honest. Sometimes temptations look gray because we want them to be. And what needs to happen for us is that our convictions and our affections are on a greater reality than our temptations. We need to step back and 
recognize that it is God that we would be offending. It is God that we would be sinning against. And it would be God's presence that we would be forfeiting. Now, the Bible says God never will leave you nor forsake you. And that's right. His grace is rich and new every morning. But in the reality of our sinful, willful behavior, there is indeed an effect on our enjoyment of God's presence. One commentator put it this way. One cannot willfully sin against God and continue to enjoy his presence. That's a simple reality. And so the application coming out of this is this. If it has been a while since you have enjoyed God's presence, perhaps it is because you are justifying willful, perpetual sin in your life. Enjoy that statement because I had to think on it all week this week. It is a reality that God invites us to enjoy his presence. And if we are not, It could be because we are enjoying something else. The third area where we see the Lord's presence with Joseph is when no one else was with him. At the end of our text, verses 19 through 23, we see the reality of Joseph's isolation. Now, as we say this story, and as you've learned this story, Joseph was successful in the beginning, verses 1 through 6. He withstood temptation in verses 7 through 20. And so we would think, all right, Joseph did the right thing. And so our logic would be, well, it's going to turn out awesome for him. Joseph's going to be honored as a man of integrity, and he's going to be given more responsibilities in Potiphar's house. Or maybe Joseph would even be released from Potiphar's house and have a household of his own because he did the right thing. And we would expect that, wouldn't we? Because our internal logic is if I do the right thing, then it's going to turn out the right way. But life often has shown us otherwise, right? And so the big question for me as I've read this narrative is, what should our response be when you do the right things for God and yet you experience trauma or tragedy or disappointment in life time and time again? What should our response be? And what was the result of Joseph's faithfulness in the presence of the Lord and to the Lord's ways? We'll look at verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. Maybe this, is, maybe this isn't a good story. <laughs> maybe it's a bad, bad story. You do the right things and you end up in prison. Or maybe it's a really, really real story. I wonder if some of you in this room are struggling with that same type of disappointment. You've tried to do the right thing to honor God with your life. You have fought against temptation. You've been faithful with the things that he has given you, but your heart is broken. You're disappointed. Bad things have happened. How do you respond? I wonder how Joseph was responding at this point. We're not given that, but we can probably assume the reality of Joseph's response, can't we? Again, (laughs) here I am again. What's interesting in Hebrew, the language is, the word for prison is the same word for pit. They're interchangeable. And so at the end of chapter 37, we see Joseph thrown into a pit as his brothers betrayed him. And here in chapter 39, we see Joseph thrown into a pit as he is once again betrayed. You can imagine the isolation and the loneliness that Joseph might be feeling at this point in time. The woe is me. Is this really worth it reality? I can't keep doing this, God. Why are you doing this to me? I wonder if you've ever asked that question of God. Why are you doing this to me? And the answer for Joseph is probably the same answer for us. Look at verse 21. The narrator, Moses, writes this down because this is the thought that must accompany Joseph's isolation. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. Perhaps this narrative isn't so much to teach us how to handle success or to handle temptation, but rather how to handle disappointment. Perhaps 
in the midst of the deepest disappointment that Joseph has felt after all these years and after all this perpetual disappointment, it is now that God's answer to Joseph is, my steadfast love will be upon you. And the steadfast love of God is a really interesting term. It's the Hebrew word hesed. And hesed actually means that it is God's active love of provision for those that are his. It is God's active partnership with his children. And so what is it that is actually being said in verse 21 is the Lord was with him and showed him his active love. One commentator said that this has said love of God is God willing to commit himself to another by making it making his promise a matter of solemn record. He is writing it down that he will be with Joseph in the midst of his despair. And he's writing it down that in the midst of your big questions of life, he will be there. Now, you may catch yourself saying, well, that worked for Joseph. That was great for him. We, my situation is different though. I'm in a dire life situation. I can't keep doing this. And I certainly don't feel the steadfast love of God sustaining me. Friend, can I redirect your thought just for one moment? We have the perspective on Joseph's life that Joseph didn't have as he lived. We can look back on his life and we can see exactly how these events worked out together. We can see that his time in prison, he gained more success while he was there and he earns the trust of the keeper of the prison. And we can see that while in prison, Joseph interpreted more dreams for people and in turn gained a reputation as someone to be trusted. We can learn once again that the prisoners who he interpreted the dreams for were released and worked for Pharaoh and they told Pharaoh about Joseph. And we can learn as we look back that Joseph was ultimately released by Pharaoh after Pharaoh interp- or after Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. And then we can learn that as Joseph was released that he was placed in a powerful position to give blessing to the whole world in the midst of famine. And we can say it all worked out. But we don't have that ability in our life. And so all we have is to live in the moment just like Joseph did in that moment. And we know as we look back that the unfortunate events were necessary for Joseph to be in a proper position at the proper times to be a proper blessing to all the world for the glory of God. And that same reality is true for you and I. But we don't know that, not yet. And we don't know how God is guiding you through these moments and how he is sustaining you and how these moments will be the ultimate end of his glory being realized in your life and in testimony to those around you. See, God saved Joseph not from suffering, but through suffering. And there's a reality that that might very well be our experience. God is doing a work in your heart even when we don't know it. I was given a quote this week out of a book that many of you ladies maybe are, are reading for the Good Food event here at Old North. It's a book called The Scars That Shaped Me. It's going to be on the screen behind me, the quote, but I just want to read a segment out of it that is, I think, applicable to this point. The author writes, life is full of pain. Sometimes God miraculously de- delivers us, and when he does, we rejoice and give him glory. He makes all things new and he brings beauty from ashes. And sometimes we aren't delivered, but he gives us true contentment in our circumstances so the world can see his peace and satisfaction. And sometimes he leaves us with a constant ache, a reminder that this world is not our home and that we are just strangers passing through. This relentless ache is what drives me to my knees, brings me to Jesus, makes me long for heaven, And perhaps in heaven, I will thank God most for my unfulfilled longings because they did the deepest, most lasting work in my soul. And in the meantime, never underestimate God's quiet care in the midst of your suffering to bring you to the very best place a human on this earth can be found in. Fully aware of your humanity and fully reliant on God's wonderful plan.
if the most important and sustaining hope that we have in life, as I said at the beginning of our sermon, if the most important and and sustaining hope that we have in this life is the presence of God with us, then that changes how we should look at Jesus Christ. Do you remember how he was presented? When the angels came and talked to Mary, they said his name shall be Emmanuel, God with us. And in Jesus Christ, we have God with us in the midst of our sufferings. As one who suffered, as one who knows our temptations, as one who draws near to the broken, he is one who sticks closer, to the, closer than a brother. He is the one who not only hears you when you pray, but he's at the right hand of God pleading for you. He will help you in the morning of your struggle as his mercies are new every day. And his, and his name is not just a promise realized, but he is a person like you and I, yet fully God, Emmanuel, God with us. And so, Jesus is God with us. And so we can say that in the brutal unknown of this life, you can trust that the Lord's presence and providence is still firmly in place. And his steadfast love will hold you fast until the day when his presence is seen and his providence is understood. And until that day, I say to you all, May the Lord be with you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the reality of your presence and the hope that is ours because of it. Lord, I pray for those in this midst who are struggling in the midst of brokenness, even feeling the pangs of despair with big questions about your purposes. I pray, Lord, that we would understand that your presence and your providence of life are never, ever thwarted by the reality of this life. Lord, may we have faith and patience in the midst of the unknown to trust in your goodness and your full work. And Lord, may we cry out to our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the midst of these times, knowing full well that we have God with us in him. And so, Lord, thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray that even now as we think about our life, Lord, may your spirit do good work of opening our hearts to trust you even more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.